Okay, ma'am. Uh, a very warm good morning to our eminent guest, Dr. Prakash Chauhan, Director of Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, Dehradun, faculty members, and to all who are present here from different countries and institutions. I, Priyanka Roy, welcome you all on behalf of Center for Climate Change and Water Research at Suresh Gangwar University. In this esoteric webinar on Earth, Research, Earth Observation Satellite for Social, Environmental and Economic Studies, we are very delighted and eagerly looking forward to have you all involved in the quest of embracing knowledge. Today's webinar addresses the current and future role of Indian Earth Observation Satellite in solving large-scale environmental problems. It will also provide a comprehensive overview of key societal applications that have been embedded globally with the issue of uh, with the use of Earth observation data. Now, I would like with this, I would like to call upon Dr. Shruti Kanga, the coordinator of Center for Climate Change and Water Research, to take forward today's session with the welcome address. Madam Shruti Kanga. Thank you, Priyanka. Good morning, everyone. Greetings to one and all. I, Dr. Shruti Kanga, Associate Professor and Coordinator, Center for Climate Change and Water Research. Welcome to you all. It gives me immense pleasure to grace all of your presence in the interest of the entire committee. It gives me a tremendous happiness to be presenting the welcome speech among the most esteemed people who have privileged their uh, respective fields. Before we begin this webinar, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who have sincerely committed to this event to make it a great success. This event would have been impossible without the support of each of one, each and every one of you present over here. From this platform, I would also like to thank my management, the higher authorities of the university, and the complete SGVU team. Webinars are organized and uh, conducted for the general audience to gain insight and informative that remains effective in their uh, work, life exercises, and work. Today's webinar, uh, we have chosen keeping in mind the youth. The topic of today's webinar is Earth Observation Satellites for Socioeconomic and Environmental Studies. The benefits of Earth observation from space have a huge and significant impact on economy, the quality of life, the ability to protect our nation, and the ability to manage environmental and natural resources are very much improved by the use of these Earth observation satellite data sets. Though this webinar, an individual is given a platform to gain knowledge about Earth observation satellites and their potential contribution in socio-economic and environmental well-being. I would like to give a brief about my university now from this platform that SGVU is one of the prestigious universities located in Jaipur uh, in the state of Rajasthan. It is the first private university in the state of Rajasthan that has been aggregated NAC A with uh, uh, UGC ranking. The university has uh, students across the world in the field of, you know, um, engineering, sciences, management, pharmacy, liberal studies, hotel management, education, agriculture, and healthcare. Now, about uh, I would like to give a brief about my center also. Uh, the Center for Climate Change and Water Research <coughs> aims at various research and developmental activities and um, has a lot of research uh, and premier, uh, you know, um, uh, books in the field of uh, climate change and water research. Then uh, uh, in, with various, uh, you know, publication houses that uh, consist of Springer, Taylor Francis, uh, Willie, Science Direct, uh, etc. We have, uh, you know, good faculties from various IITs, NITs, Central Universities, Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology, etc. The center is also very active in conducting and organizing various, you know, workshops, seminars, uh, uh, then um, conferences, so that 
the researchers, the eminent scientists, academicians, and students, they got a platform where they can discuss the problems related to the, uh, you know, climate change, uh, sustainable development, and many other things, so that uh, decisions can be taken and that can be implemented at the community level. Uh, about the courses of the center, we have uh, started from, you know, uh, graduation level up to PhD level in our center. We have BSc Geology, we take in Geoinformatics, MTech program in Geoinformatics, MSc Geoinformatics, and PhD program in various applications of Geoinformatics. So this is a brief about the university, about the, you know, webinar. Now I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Priyanka to brief, uh, give a brief about our uh, uh, guest, Dr. Prakash Johan. Please, Priyanka. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now I take this opportunity to give a brief introduction of our eminent guest. Today we are honored to have Dr. Prakash Johan, the director of Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, Dehradun to grace this webinar session with his Agha's presence. Dr. Prakash Chauhan has obtained his postgraduate degree in applied geophysics from IIT Roorkee and PhD in physics from Gujarat University, Ahmedabad. Dr. Chauhan joined ISRO in 1991 as a scientist and since then has been working on application of remote sensing technology for natural resource management for ocean and land resources. Dr. Chauhan initiated researches, uh, research activities for planetary remote sensing at Space Application Center to study solar system objects, mainly Earth, Moon, Mars, through Indian planetary mission. His major achievement in the areas of Earth observation application includes development of algorithm of, for ocean color parameter retrieval, marine life resource assessment, aerosol remote sensing for space-based air quality monitoring, river and reservoir water level estimation, and coastal zone management. He has done leading work in using hyperspectral data for lunar surface composition mapping and moon mineralogy mapper instrument for Chandraya. He has been the PI of infrared image in, uh, spectrometer instrument on board Chandraya 2 mission. He has also led a team of scientists for scientific analysis of data from for Mars Orbitary Mission. He has published more than 100 research papers in both national and international journals. Dr. Chauhan is an executive member of International Ocean Color Coordination Group. He has represented ISRO as a co-chair of Ocean Color Constellation. Currently, he is a member of prestigious NASA ISRO Planetary Science Working Group. Among the various commendation and reward, Dr. Chauhan is a proud recipient of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai Award by Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad, ISRO Merit Award by ISRO, and Satish Dhawan Award by IIRS, Dehradun. Now, with this note, I would like to uh, call upon Dr. Prakash Chauhan to take this session forward. So, Please praise us. Yeah, good morning to you all. I am am I audible to everyone? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, good morning to you, uh, all participants of today's uh, webinar. Uh, good morning. Good morning, to, good morning to Dr. Shruti Kanga and Dr. Suresh Kumar uh, Singh uh, from Suresh Gyan uh, Vihar University in Jaipur. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, for this particular webinar, uh, which is being hosted by your institution. As I, as I understand, you are all involved, uh, you know, in undergraduation and graduate level studies in the field of uh, remote sensing and geospatial technology. So uh, I extend, uh, you know, my from my side, a uh, warm welcome to all the participants of uh, today's webinar. As I understand, uh, we may have, you know, very mixed audience and uh, probably from different and diverse backgrounds. So I will uh, like to keep my talk very simple and mostly we will be focusing on the, uh, you know, less on the technology, but more on the applications of geospatial technology uh, in the broad field of uh, earth observation science. Uh, so uh, 
May I uh, just share my presentation? Yes, So the presentation is visible to everyone? Yes, sir. It is yes, visible, sir. sir. Oh, thank you. So, we'll start. so as you can see, uh, the title of my today's talk is ISRO's Earth Observation Mission uh, for Societal Benefits. Uh, ISRO, you know, is, uh, uh, is the Indian Space Agency, and uh, it is one of the uh, leading space agencies of the world. Uh, uh, along with the uh, you know space agencies like NASA of United States of America, European Space Agency of uh, Europe, uh, as well as uh, Japanese Space Agency JAXA, Chinese and Indian Space Agency. These are the four or five uh, major space uh, agencies in the world uh, which are involved in the world class uh, you know space programs. Now, as uh, I show you in first uh, slide here. Uh, what you can see is this is the picture of a glacier. In fact, this is one of the famous glaciers. Uh, glaciers are nothing but the storehouse of uh, fresh water. So this is the famous glacier called Gangotri Glacier. And at this location, you know, the river Ganga uh, originates from a place called Gomukh. And the Himalayan region, this broad Himalayan region, which is encompassing from Hindu Kush, then coming to central Himalaya and the eastern Himalaya, you know, it's, this is a board of large number of such glaciers and many of the snow cap, you know, mountains are uh, throughout the year, they uh, provide water to the river systems, which basically feed millions of people here in the Indo-Gangetic Plains. And this plains, as you can see, they are most fertile plain and they provide, you know, more than 50% of India's food grain. So this is the holistic view that how this remote sensing of various remote locations you know, can provide an idea that how can you do the natural resource management starting from you know understanding the role of snow understanding the role of glaciers and you know the water availability for our you know survival on this may i request those who are not speaking please uh, if you can mute your microphone that will be much better so as uh, many of you are aware that India's space program is one of the leading space program of the world. And it has been driven by the vision of harnessing space technology for national development uh, while pursuing the space research and planetary exploration. So this year, we celebrated the birth centenary of uh, Professor Vikram Sarabhai, who is considered to be the father of the Indian space program. Early 70s, when the Indian space program was conceived, you know, the vision of our forefathers was that we should have a this program which is dedicated for the use of technology for common men. We were not competing with the, you know, the other space powers of the world like Americans and Russians and other people were doing at that time during Cold War era. So it started with very humble beginning. The, uh, in beginning, you must have seen that, uh, you know, the early scientists were carrying rockets on the bullet carts and uh, you know, on cycles and then very small laboratories were there uh, in a place called Thumba, which is a fishing uh, village near Trivandrum where the entire space activity started. But over the last 50 years, you know, with the uh, initial vision and then commitment of uh, the leadership of India, Indian space program today, uh, we have a very well developed space activity, which basically can be divided into the four verticals. We have the space tra transportation segment where we are able to launch now, you know, the satellite systems into uh, different orbits around Earth as well as, you know, around other celestial bodies like Moon and Mars. So we have this, uh, you know, uh, polar satellite launch vehicle, PSLV, which is a workhorse of uh, Indian space program. It is a well-proven uh, rocket system, which has, uh, you know, already had more than 50 successful flights and has put many satellites into uh, polar earth orbiting as well as into the uh, 
uh, geotransfer orbits. Then what we have much more powerful rocket called GSLV. Uh, this is a rocket which can put around 4,000 kilograms of satellites into uh, the orbits. And then we are also working on technologies like reusable launch vehicles, uh, like you must have seen earlier, the NASA, NASA shuttle program. Uh, and then, of course, now SpaceX is also having the reusable launch vehicle. So ISRO is also working on these technologies. And of course, there are modular launch vehicles which can be uh, basically customized with respect to the uh, different uh, type of uh, launches uh, in terms of weight and mass for satellites can be, uh, you know, uh, can be uh, done in a, in a modular fashion. The another interesting and the most important aspect is creating the space infrastructure. You know, when you launch a satellite system into the space or the uh, uh, you know orbit around, let's say if you have to do Earth observation or what typically we call uh, remote sensing. So we are now today having full fledged self-sufficient infrastructure in this country where we can launch a satellite and which can do remote sensing of the Earth for providing data for ob Earth observation in different part of electromagnetic spectrum. Then we also have capability to develop communication satellites. Communication satellites are also very useful. Traditionally, they are normally put in a geostationary orbit where uh, you know the orbit is achieved at the height of around 35, 6,000 kilometers from the surface of Earth. And in such orbits, the satellite appears to remain static with respect to the your location. So suppose if you have to have a communication satellite over India, then such satellite can continuously observe Indian landmass and any signal transmitted to, towards the satellite can be broadcasted to a larger geographical coverage. So whatever direct to home satellite television system you receive in your homes uh, and you watch uh, your daily news and entertainment stuff is totally dependent on communication satellites launched by ISRO, which are orbiting around the uh, over the Indian uh, territory. Then, of course, the third most uh, you know, important space infrastructure segment is the navigation satellites. All of you are using GPS uh, you know, uh, system. Um, um, all mobile users today, their mobile phones are fitted, especially the smart mobile phones are fitted with GPS receivers. And wherever you go, you can locate yourself in terms of latitude, longitude, and elevation from the mean sea high. So this type of navigation satellites basically are very useful today uh, in providing what we call as the location-based services. And ISRO has also launched its own regional constellation of navigation satellite systems, which is called NAVIC. Uh, you know, we will learn more about during the course of this presentation. And then, of course, the fourth, four most, uh, fourth most important segment is space science and planetary exploration. You all must have heard about missions like Chandrayaan-1, Chandrayaan-2, and then uh, Mangalyaan missions, then AstroSat mission. So all these, uh, you know, uh, science-driven uh, satellite missions are basically uh, designed, conceived, and launched to enhance our knowledge about our own solar system in which we live, as well as about the uh, stars and the galaxies. Uh, so in this area also, ISRO has very dedicated program, and many of these uh, missions have drawn attention of uh, uh, many people in this country, especially our youths, they have got you know, excited about doing planetary exploration. Uh, last year, you all must have seen the launch of Chandrayaan-2, where we were uh, trying to put an orbiter around the orbit of moon and trying to land onto the moon surface. So this excited, this has created a good amount of excitement in the country. We are going to work on the forthcoming missions also, like Chandrayaan-3, and then a follow-on mission to the uh, Mars, mission to Venus as well, and then the mission to study the sun also is being conceived. So these are the four broad uh, you know, categories in which the space infrastructure is created. And today, uh, you know, we are all proud of that India has this indigenous capability of launching satellites to provide all these four kinds of services to the common man of this country. Then the fourth, third, uh, most important thing is that having put a satellite into orbit by a rocket, what to do with this satellite data? You know, until unless you make effective use of these observations, this uh, space infrastructure is of no use. So we have a very vibrant and dedicated program for space applications. And these space applications are dedicated towards socioeconomic security, 
sustainable development in the beginning you know we heard about sustainable development united nations has put up 17 uh, you know sustainable development goal sdgs uh, which are to be achieved by uh, all signatories uh, to this uh, uh, un sdgs uh, by 2030 so india is also having a commitment towards you know achieving this sustainable development goal for social economic development of our society so many of these goals have uh, you know, they have direct linkages with the space based observations then disasters risk reduction is another important aspect every year you know our country and countries in our neighborhood you know they are devastated by different kind of disasters either hydrometeorological disasters like flood rainfall uh, flash flood cloud burst etc or droughts or otherwise geological disasters like earthquake, uh, landslides, etc., etc. So in these uh, scenario also, the space observations provide very important role in terms of providing the information about the disaster, which can be used for uh, disaster risk reduction, as well as for providing relief and rescue to the affected population. Uh, in the field of governance today, you know, uh, large amount of you know space-based observations are going. Uh, for the government uh, purposes for doing what we call the e-governance. We'll see some examples of that during the course of this uh, talk. Then there are large amount of synergistic applications are developing, which makes use of Earth observation data, satellite communication technology, as well as the satellite navigation technology. Many of you, when you are traveling, let's say from Jaipur to Delhi or to your own respective places, most of you are today dependent on you know the uh, the different type of navigators which can take you uh, to your uh, you know uh, to your destinations which can suggest you the optimal routes the routes where the less crowd is there the faster road networks are there so these are the typical examples of earth observation and the satellite navigation you know synergies where the maps created by the earth observation data linked with the navigation thing uh, you know helps you in navigating uh, you know in different and the new terrains so many, uh, even when you order your pizza uh, from any, you know, uh, services, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, delivered to your home uh, through the help of, uh, you know, earth observation and navigation based uh, uh, portal. And these technologies are now effectively used uh, by e-commerce companies. So many such applications are, you know, coming into picture and many of the students particularly, they can think of, you know, creating new kind of uh, uh, you know, innovation as well as job opportunity in terms of launching uh, their own startups. So the era of, uh, you know, area of space applications is really vast and diverse. And it also provides opportunity to the youth in the country to have uh, their own geospatial startups. So you'll see some examples of that also. As well as the fourth important pillar is that until unless you train your manpower, you provide you know, enough knowledge and technological in, in, insights to the young people of this country, uh, many of you will not be able to use these technologies because these are very niche technologies. You need to learn them, you need to master them, and then you need to apply them in solving the real world problem. So there is a big emphasis uh, in capacity building and uh, training our youngsters so that they can adopt for uh, you know, space technology and, uh, you know, webinars like this is also a part of, of uh, uh, you know, this, uh, the, this, these efforts. Then in terms of Indianizing, the Indianization of technology, you see the entire space program in India is a typical classical example today, what we call as the Atmanirbhar Bharat. You know, we have developed the technology for launching rockets. We have developed cryogenic technology for you know, for just, you know, uh, for uh, for more powerful I mean. uh, in the country, we have uh, you know full indigenous technology for uh, you know making the sensors, developing the satellites, as well as receiving the satellite data from. The I mean. So this type of end-to-end -end indigenization of technologies and applications has been uh, you know done in ISRO, and we have. A commitment to transfer these technologies to the industry and also train our young people so that they can also generate innovative ideas. Uh, international cooperation is very important. We are also having corporate uh, cooperation agreements with other space agencies in the world and other technical, you know, in, uh, entities in in industry as well as in academia. Then, of course, the fourth, more, the most important aspect is also outreach, because many of these activities today are funded 
and you know driven by the public funding uh, which is a taxpayers money it is our and you know a duty to inform all the citizens of india that how their you know hard earned money is being spent in providing services for their own welfare so in that uh, sense you know outreach becomes very important we organize you know symposium seminars uh, webinars lectures these uh, as well as you know uh, open houses uh, to isro facilities for the citizen of this country so that they can see that how effectively the scientists are working and using these technologies for Uh, improving the life of the citizens of our country so this is in nutshell you know the complete dimensions on which the indian space program is working in today's talk we will only focus about the earth observation applications we will not touch upon the other details okay uh, so if you talk about the earth based observation of earth system you know earth as you can see it's a it's a wonderful planet in this solar system it is consisting of atmosphere it consists of a hydrosphere and then on land you have different type of resources like biological resources geological resources and then 75% of the earth surface is covered by water in terms of oceans and these oceans are also very important in terms of maintaining the climate of the planet as well as they provide us you know biological and uh, you know uh, non uh, or you can say the other type of resources geological resources as well as form of different forms of energies uh, is also obtained through the oceanic system and of course the continents are most important thing because many all the humanity is for, is you know is living on the continents we depend for our you know livelihood on all the uh, for all aspects on the natural resources you know since the birth of a child to his the completion of his journey human's journey for every small need you know we depend on earth on the mother earth you know in terms of breathing the air in terms of taking water in terms of food in terms of shelter in terms of clothing in terms of uh, you know uh, recreation and entertainment all these things are if you think deeply they are all linked with the resources which the mother earth provides to us so it's our duty to sustainably use these resources because as all of you are aware human population is ever growing you know and we estimate that the by the end of this century our population will uh, you know will need much more resources from this earth and uh, until unless uh, <coughs> we use the resources on this earth in a sustainable renewable fashion it may not be possible for earth to sustain the human population so uh, you know to to provide food security water security enhance uh, you know Uh, to safeguard against uh, you know to safeguard ag us against the enhanced natural disasters and social and health security you know we need to uh, monitor uh, our earth or our planet so we have put a different kind of satellites because satellites can go around they can continuously provide you data over different parts of the planet very remote parts like himalayan you know glacial system uh, open oceans then other areas where humans cannot reach remote sensing uh, has the capability to provide you the information what is happening in terms of processes then we have the mid satellites which are basically what we call as the meteorological satellites they keep eye on the weather systems which are developing the large amount of cyclones uh, keeps on developing in ocean and when they hit uh, coastal regions they provide you know they pr produce large amount of Uh, damage so we can today have uh, capability of keeping eye on this natural disaster similarly we have this communication and navigation satellite systems they also help us uh, you know uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, keeping us connected to each other uh, as well as you know helping us uh, you know in terms of providing entertainment as well as as i told you, in terms of navigating so uh for all, in in terms of all aspects in terms of atmospheric aspects we can understand more about the atmospheric dynamics we can understand more about the biological resources like forest etc uh, loss of biodiversity loss of critical habitats uh, snow glaciers i told you is very important ecosystem where we uh, 
every year we are totally dependent for our waters in the river on these uh, ecosystems then oceans uh, we have threats of rising sea level because of the climate uh, change warming of the planet destruction of coral reefs ocean circulation uh, which basically helps the distribution of heat from equator to the polar regions and maintain the temperatures of this planet and then in terms of understanding the land dynamics uh, water availability in the reservoirs rivers soil degradation is a big problem today uh, how to keep our soil fertile in terms of you know uh, keeping the productivity in our farms uh, up to a certain level and then you know there are threats of bio biodiversity loss also so overall you know in terms of understanding the adverse effect of changing climate also the satellite data you know becomes very important so the use of space technology uh, in uh, along with remote sensing data along with the uh, navigation data and along with the software technology if you combine together this whole entity is called geospatial technology so today geospatial technology is a very important technology and in each and every sphere of life it is being used what are the advantages of uh, you know provide getting the remote sensing data you get a synoptic coverage that means you can cover large amount of area in less number of time if you have to do the same thing by a manual survey you know it will take large amount of time and resources you can have systematic revisits that means let's say if your satellite is revisiting a place after 5 days you can get the information again after 5 days and then like that for years all together you can monitor the earth uh, you know from this type of systems then see the things which is invisible to the human eyes as all of you are aware the humans have a limited capability to see in the electromagnetic spectrum our eyes are only sensitive in the visible part of electromagnetic spectrum we cannot sense anything in infrared in microwave in radio wave or towards the ultraviolet and gamma ray of the electromagnetic spectrum but once we develop the sensors which can operate in this part of electromagnetic spectrum we can you know see the objects which have the very different response in different part of electromagnetic spectrum with the help of satellite based sensors or maybe airborne or the uav based uh, you know observation systems then multi scale observations today we have capability of observing earth uh, you know let's say at 1 km spatial resolution to let's say less than 30 cm spatial resolution where even a you know a person walking on the street or a car moving on the street or the car number plate it's also can be read from the space based observation system so this kind of information is being used for multiple purposes including the defense uh, intelligence gathering uh, you know for governance related aspects also across border you know uh, activities uh, surveillance also so very high resolution to coarse resolution scales of observations are possible from satellite data and it, these observations are pretty cost effective as i told you if you have to do a similar thing it will cost huge amount of money but when you put these sensors onto a space based system Uh, the cost comes down drastically uh, the global navigation system this like gps or gnss or navic systems they provide you the location which is very important thing everybody wants to know that where you are at a given time in space uh, navigate you you know through the uh, other territories it also provides you accurate time information uh, some of the navigation satellites also have limited communication abilities and many of them can also have limited observation capabilities then the third component of geospatial technology is basically geographic information system or gis it is nothing but a software tool which basically is capable of visualization archiving retrieving and analyzing uh, all this data either the special data or non special data uh, can be linked together and then one can do integrated analysis in terms of finding optimal solutions to your problem so these technologies uh, you know is uh, all these components put together is called the geospatial technology now just to give you a brief you know it's basics of remote sensing many of you may be aware but those students who is new you know to them i would introduce the concept of remote sensing uh, you know the classical definition of remote sensing is that it is the sensing of the earth surface from space or from let's say airborne or a uav based platform by making use of properties of electromagnetic wave emitted reflected or diffracted by the sense objects for the purpose of improving natural resource management land use and the protection of our environment so you you know you came across 
three terms emission reflection or diffraction so many of you i am sure must be aware about reflection when the sunlight is reflected by the earth surface uh, and sensed by a sensor the way typically uh, we see each other uh, that's a classical example of reflected energy acquisition uh, but what is emission emission is nothing but sensing the emitted uh, you know uh, energy emitted energy is like your body has its own temperature you know you emit certain radiation from your body that's why your you know if somebody touches your hand or your forehead they feels that your body is having some heat so based on this heat you know certain amount of energy is emitted so this emitted energy also can be sensed in let's say in the thermal part of our thermal infrared and then temperature also can be sensed as a two dimensional image so this emission also uh, you know emitted energy from earth also helps you in getting let's say parameters like land surface temperature sea surface temperature etc etc okay so this is a classical thing Uh, where you uh, typically have sun as a source of energy and this energy travels through atmosphere it gets reflected and then recorded at a sensor and then you create this type of two dimensional images then you uh, analyze these images you extract the information and you produce thematic maps let's say flood maps or uh, you know crop maps or forest maps or water body maps so then this information is basically used for decision making or for governance related purposes now just to give you a brief about what is electromagnetic spectrum many of you may be aware it is the spectrum of energy which is uh, basically emitted by the sun and then typically they are uh, you know uh, spread uh, they are you know defined from uh, lower wavelengths to the higher wavelengths energy you have ultraviolet uh, part of electromagnetic or ultraviolet radiation which has typical wavelengths of around 0.1 microns then you have visible Uh, wavelengths which basically around from 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers and then beyond is the infrared part of electromagnetic spectrum and this is the spectrum of incoming sunlight that means since the sun's temperature is around 6000 degree kelvin uh, based on the laws of planck's law you know it peaks at around 550 nanometers or 0.55 micron and then it tapers off but earth's you know work bulk temperature is around 300 degree kelvin so the emitted energy of the earth peaks at around 4 micron or so and then it tapers off so this red uh, portion of this graph is the emitted component of the earth's energy and the rest of the component which you see is typically the reflected component of the uh, uh, of the energy which can be sensed by a sensor which has been mounted onto a uh, any platform which is going around the so you have this uv range and then visible range and then infrared range 1.3 1.3 micron then the short wave infrared range from 0.1 uh, 1.3 to 3 micron and then you know the overall optical reflective range is from 0.3 to 3 micron and 3 micron and beyond is basically your emit emitted range or the where you can basically sense the emitted energy so based on these basic principles of earth observation you know uh, sensors and satellites isro currently having you know a four th different type of thematic series of satellites you know we have classified our space assets uh, especially for earth observation into four series uh, first series is basically meant for natural resource inventory and disaster management so you have resource set 2 and 2a these are the two satellites which are currently operating uh, they have uh, three different type of uh, you know sensors uh, there is a sensor called uh, awif advanced wide field uh, you know sensor it has a special resolution of around 56 meter revisit capability of around 5 days or so and then there is a list 3 sensor which has a you know imaging capability of around 23 meter special resolution and list 4 camera which has a special resolution of around 5.8 meter with different revisiting capacities for different uh, you know uh sensors so this type of data uh, is very useful for natural resource inventory like forest cover mapping then water bodies assessment uh, you know uh, block level to the district level crop acreage assessment and then um, uh, also useful for uh, let us say uh, you know snow cover uh, mapping and then up to some extent list four data is also useful for glacier mapping and then glacier uh, you know uh, glacial ice loss uh, quantification etc etc so 
this uh, series of satellite data is very widely popular and many of you must have used this type of data some of you also may be using you know equivalent data from foreign satellites like landsat data 30 meter special resolution and now sentinel data uh, around 10 meter special resolution which is also typically uh, considered to be under this category of natural resource inventory then we have the high special resolution satellite systems basically they are used for large scale mapping infrastructure planning and cartography so we had this cartosat bun satellite which was basically a stereo satellite that means you have satellite images uh, you know uh, of same area seen from two different view angles and using the concept of photogrammetry one can calculate the digital elevation model that means the third dimension uh, also Uh, latitude longitude and the height from the mean sea level could be derived and a 10 meter uh, digital elevation model for entire india is now available from cartosat 1 satellite data then there was another satellite called cartosat 2 uh, then uh, recently we had a series of similar satellites where you have the special resolution in panchromatic mode that means in black and white around 0.5 meter special resolution and multi spectral mode around 1.5 meter so you can combine these two data sets and produce color images at around 50 cm resolution from carto 2s you know satellite data so uh, for uh, applications like you know mapping at 1 to 4000 scale Uh, you know detecting objects uh, which are of interest from the defense point of view as well as you know uh, doing surveillance uh, as well as uh, you know monitoring road uh, infrastructure construction urban uh, you know conglomerates urban growth this type of satellite data becomes very very important then we have the third series of satellites called the oceanographic series series of satellite as i i was telling you oceans are very important in terms of understanding the climate of this planet as well as in terms of understanding the you know the availability of the resources especially the biological resources so we have launched this ocean series of satellites we had currently operating ocean sat 2 satellite which is a sensor called ocean color monitor it can provide you information about the chloral content in the ocean water which is linked to the productivity and then also applications have been developed where this chlorophyll content along with see some surface temperature can be linked to generate information about potential fishing zones in the ocean and this information is provided to the fishermen so that they can do you know profitable fishing and their profits can increase if we tell them that which are the areas which are more suitable or where more fishes uh, can be found so this type of applications are very uh, you know uh, uh, very very popular then ocean state forecast large amount of you know activity is done in ocean especially you know shipping then um, uh, navy uh, naval activities they want to know that like we have the weather forecast similarly they want to know that what will be the ocean state forecast what type of waves will be there what type of wind will be there ocean surface what type of currents will be there so all this information is put together and we generate what we call the ocean state forecast then similarly we have launched another satellite called saral altica you know this is having an altimeter these altimeters are very useful instruments in terms of providing the sea level height so many of you must have heard that the sea level is rising and uh, there is a threat to the coastal regions that many areas you know the low lying areas like islands of lakshadweep uh, islands of maldives and other island nations are under threat because of the rising sea level so using this uh, altimeters we can basically monitor the sea level rise very effectively up to centimeter scale then we have another satellite which is very useful in uh, for weather forecasting and understanding the wind vectors over the ocean is called scattermeter and this scattermeter data is very much useful in uh, you know locating uh, early uh, locations of uh, cyclones what we call as the cyclone genesis as well as providing the wind vectors over the ocean surface which goes into the uh, weather models for providing accurate weather forecast over oceanic regions then the fourth series of satellite is basically what we call as the weather and climate series of satellite now day to day weather is very important all of us are dependent on the weather phenomena for our day to day activities and it becomes very important especially during monsoon period in india where you would like to know that how much amount of rainfall can occur and nowadays many of you are aware that uh, uh, you know the severe rainfall situations or extreme rainfall situations are 
increasing every year this year also many of you must have suffered especially in i know that uh, there were episodes of very heavy rainfall in jaipur region and all so for this type of events you need to have very accurate forecast so that at least people become prepared so now we have two satellites one is called insat 3d and insat 3d r they are basically in the geostationary orbit and these satellites put together every 15 minutes today we have capability of observing weather phenomena over india and these data sets are now assimilated into the numerical weather forecasting models of india meteorology department and their forecast has how about weather has significantly improved by assimilating the data from these uh, satellites into the weather forecast models so these are the work hards for the meteorologist and weather forecast capabilities over india uh, has tremendously increased by the help of these two satellite systems uh, so uh, having uh, told you about the space assets how this uh, data has enhanced our remote sensing capability so we have uh, you know land and water resource cartographic applications weather applications and ocean applications is basically providing us high resolution imaging stereo imaging capability ocean color ocean altimeter ocean wind vectors uh, uh, temperature and uh, humidity profiles in the atmosphere we can get information about the temperature of the sea in terms of sea surface temperature we can measure rain above oceans and now rain above the land also then we can generate humidity profiles in the atmosphere we also have microwave satellite system currently our ri set one is not working but very soon we are going to launch but uh, international satellites are providing all weather imaging services where you can see through the clouds using microwave data uh, using synthetic aperture radar sensors so they are very useful for flood mapping and other applications then of course there are new set of technologies which we call as the hyperspectral remote sensing technologies these type of satellites are also being developed and then for climatic studies we can monitor the radiation of the earth uh, you know earth uh, earth radiation budget that means how much amount of energy from sun is coming and how much is leaving that balance can be used to understand the climate of this particular planet along with this we also have developed a good amount of network for supporting the ground observations you know ground observations are very useful in terms of you know verifying the accuracy of the satellite product so large amount of ground measurements are also made along with the satellite data and then you know you are ready what we call as earth observation system so all these things basically uh, are put together for the use Uh, for socio economic security sustainable development disaster reduction and governance uh, purpose now what i will do i will show you some of the examples of these application areas so the major applications of this satellite uh, data sets which you get from these wonderful satellites are in broadly you know categorized into different field so one of the important uh, you know sdg or the sustainable development goal is to have food security for all you know by 2030 now when we say food security what does it mean food security means that you have enough food for your population you know uh, of different you know uh, you know segments uh, from very poor to the rich people of course for them there is not much of a problem but the poor population of your country you know for them you should have enough reserves so that you can provide them you know uh, affordable food uh, food grains so for that what is needed uh, you know you uh, what you can do from space uh, of course space can only uh, you know give you information that how much amount of food is being produced at what uh, location and in which uh, you know period of time and what is the condition of the crops at a given time so today we have programs uh, where the crop acreage that means the area under different crops is monitored regularly you know all the v ravi crops and kharif crops are monitored using space data and then uh, every year early assessment about the uh, how much area is under uh, different crops are generated statistics is generated using space data and this information is provided to the policy makers essentially ministry of agriculture how this data is important let us say a year uh, you know we come to know that uh, let's say a given crop for example let's say onion is that less amount of onion has been sown by the farmers 
then this becomes very important information for the ministry. So if that early knowledge is there, then they can do planning for importing the onions into the country so that the prices of the onions can be regulated. And then if you have excess production, then the government can decide that this year they will allow this much of quantities of exports of onion so that the farmers and the other people can get benefited by the export. So the export import decision making by the government of India becomes you know, very much dependent on this type of inputs about the availability of different type of crops uh, you know, in this net. And then once you know the area, you can also, you know, the scientists have also developed algorithms by making use of other data sets like uh, the vigor of the crop in terms of NDVI, in terms of temperature, in terms of water availability. They develop models for predicting the yield that how much amount of productivity is likely to happen if this much crop is there on the ground. So this type of you know work is now operationally done in India uh, by an agency called uh, MNCFC, Mahalanobis Crop Forecasting Center under Ministry of Agriculture. This has been incubated by ISRO. So every year for more than 11 crops now, they are doing this regular monitoring and then providing the vital statistics about the crops to the country so that the country can ensure for, you know, enough amount of food for food security of the population. Similarly, the crop condition and assessment also is very important. Now, many times you happen that uh, adverse weather events like hailstorm or sudden uh, rainfall or very heavy rainfall can damage the crops or even pests. Recently, you must have seen episode of locust attacks. So this pest infestation also can damage very badly the crops. So this damaged crops also you can assess using the space data over large area and can provide information to the companies like uh, let's say crop insurance companies uh, for settling the claims of the farmers also. This becomes very important asset. Then droughts, basically the agriculture drought is another important area uh, where now the satellite data is going as a very regular input, the manual drought manual, which has been cleared by government of India and, uh, you know, which has been accepted by, even by the Supreme Court today, heavily relies on the space-based normalized difference vegetation index inputs. So for the districts in which the conclusive fall in the NDVI is seen from the satellite data, they only can be declared as drought prone districts and the other relief measures from the government of India are basically uh, decided based on the satellite based inputs. So uh, agriculture drought assessment nowadays uh, needs satellite data uh, invariably for declaring drought in different districts. Then similarly for developing horticulture, India is the, you know, the second largest producer of the horticulture crops. So for developing and you know uh, uh, site suitability for, for different type of horticulture crops, large amount of inputs from space technology are going. Uh, soil salinity and alkalinity is also an important uh, you know, problem in uh, different uh, districts of India where uh, you know, soil conditions becomes important. So soil salinity also can be monitored from a space-based observation. So these are some of the areas where, you know, which we have classified in terms of food security. If you can get vital inputs from space, then you can ensure that you have enough uh, food security for the population uh, so that you know prices in the market can be uh, can remain under control uh, then water you know without water food is important but water is equally important so water resource is a very critical thing and every year we are facing you know the crunch of water uh, in different parts especially in the western uh, part of the country rajasthan gujarat madhya pradesh you know the water supply is limited only during the monsoon period uh, so, there is a water resource information system which has been developed. So, surface water bodies are now being monitored uh, throughout the year. And then, whenever there is a depletion in the surface water bodies, early warning and alarm systems are, you know, given to the uh, to the regulatory agencies, and they basically advise to, you know, optimally use the water resources. Similarly, you know. Uh, watershed development, you know, in large part of the country, you must have seen that this type of structures have been developed. So now where to put this structure, uh, you have to double see the, you know, the local watershed conditions, drainage conditions, and then decide that where this type of, you know, structure should be put so that enough water can be accumulated. And Rajasthan and Gujarat has done fantastically well in terms of watershed development program. So during the monsoon period, you can store a lot of water, which otherwise would have flown uh, as runoff. 
but now once this water is stored this remains into this watershed development areas uh, for a very long period and then it can be utilized during the summer and it also you know recharges the ground water so this type of watershed development activities are basically driven by the remote sensing inputs then groundwater prospect and recharge area uh, this uh, this is another important area where uh, you know not where direct inferences but at least indirect inferences are basically obtained from satellite based observations then infrastructure development urban infrastructure now where government of india has a program called uh, amrit program where more than 500 you know small towns are now Uh, under master plan development process so this master plan for 500 uh, towns and cities is now being used uh, being developed with the help of uh, sensing and gis technologies similarly rural road connectivity whether the roads are being built or not uh, how much roads are being built all these observations can be done with the help of satellite data then urban sprawl studies growth analysis uh, societal empowerment then environment and forest forest cover every two year in india the forest cover mapping is done at 1 to 50000 scale by forest survey of india and the forest state of report is produced to ascertain that we are able to conserve our forest snow glacier another is important area desertification natural resource census grassland productivity disasters near real time monitoring of floods national uh, you know database for emergency management international charter that means in neighboring countries if there is a disaster we also provide satellite data to them landslides we provide information about the lands the forest fire especially in the northern you know himalayan region every year during the summer period we have this forest fire so now we have an operational you know methodology to give uh, information about the forest fires similarly weather and climate there are large amount of application so what i will show you some of these examples now so as you can see the most important part of this world which is the largest reservoir of the fresh water is this himalayan region now i will just show you this particular video which tells you the holistic distribution of snow and ice in himalaya so this is basically the pamir part of himalaya this is hindu kush in pakistan and this is our part of himalaya in uh, you know so this you can see that large amount of snow clad um, clad mountains they basically when the seasonal snow melts and uh, this melting of the seasonal flow provides water into the different river systems which emanates and then ultimately uh, you know provides water to the plains into gangetic plains this is famous gangotri glacier uh, and then this is the river uh, ganga which emanates from the uh, gl uh, from the gangotri glacier similarly these are the different glacial systems you can see this another glacier and <coughs> so the glaciers are nothing but stored ice over uh, you know stored ice uh, over a period of time the snow every year the seasonal snow if the snow does not melt 100% then this residual snow over hundreds and thousands of year becomes ice and this ice ice is stored in this glacial system and slowly these glaciers moves and when they melt at the tips they also produce large amount of water so around 15 to 16% of water in the river systems of himalaya is produced by melting of uh, glaciers but for uh, you know river systems like uh, indus almost 80% of the water in indus comes by the melting of snow and glaciers but like rivers like ganga uh, this component is less the, the more component is coming from rainfall and then uh for brahmaputra also the rainfall is more dominated now this is the part of uh you know tibet which is basically called at the roof of the world where the large amount of you know glacial lakes are there so if you have a look from space you can see from this angle that how does the himalaya looks like you know this is the roof of the world or what is called tibet and then these are the plains or the foothills you know where i am sitting here this is the part of uh, you know this is dehradun and then the hills of india come you know then the plains of indian uh, indo gangetic uh, belt is there this is the mighty river brahmaputra which comes all the way from here and then descends into the plain of india so this is a very holistic view of himalaya you know this you can see the the plains and the foothill regions and this is the mighty river of uh, brahmaputra which originates from here so himalaya basically sustains a good amount of human population not only in india but in china in myanmar 
and then in the East Asia as well as in the Central Asia. So this is a very mighty system which is basically responsible for large amount of sustainability in this part of the world. So this provide huge amount of water resources and using the remote sensing data, we can monitor surface water dynamics, surface water spread, snow cover in entire Himalaya on daily basis. Then how this snow is melting and providing runoff, we can calculate seasonally and short term uh, snow re melt runoff. Surface runoff from the uh, rainfall events can also be calculated. Annual long term water availability in our river systems, we can estimate the reservoirs, you know, the big dams which we have created, their capacity, you know, continuously depletes because they keep on, you know, accumulating the silt and sediment. So, uh, suppose like 30 years a reservoir is operating, its capacity will reduce because every year large amount of silt is getting deposited. So, we can also calculate the reservoir storage in terms of sedimentation losses. Then we have to create new infrastructure, like in terms of creating new canal systems, new watershed or irrigation, uh, you know, potential. So all this management practices also large amount of input from the satellite data goes. And water informatics, we are now generating all this information and putting in terms of water geoportals like India Vares, or there are state driven, you know, uh, Telangana water resource system, Andhra Pradesh water resource system. For other, every state, there is a water resource system and decision support uh, tool or DSS tool for optimally using this water management can be done by combining large amount of information. What I'm showing you here is the Himalayan snow cover dynamics. You know, So this is how the snow cover varies in seasonally from winter to summer in Indian Himalayas. And this is the long-term seasonality. So you can see that from 2000 to 2018, there's not much of variation in terms of snow cover in Himalayan system. And this is the amount of, you know, uh, snow cover area for different type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, watershed. So for Indus, large amount of area basically uh, is coming under snow cover area. So that's why the Indus basically receives large amount of rainfall from uh, snow melting compared to what it is there from Brahmaputra and Ganga. So, uh, this is another, uh, you know, fly through. You can generate a beautiful fly through in terms of understanding the glacial system. So this is a fly through which we have generated from Cartoset data. So this is the Gangotri River over here, and then we will go to the Gomukh, where from where the Ganga originates. So now we are approaching Gomukh. This is the River Ganga or River Bhagirathi. This is where you know, the Ganga originates. This is the Gomukh and this is Gangotri Glacier. Now you are onto the Gangotri Glacier. Glacier is nothing but I told you accumulated ice for a period of time. And this is how this Gangotri Glacier looks like, you know, from space. So what I call it that I will show you the Gangotri, I will show you Badrinath, I will show you, you know, Kedarnath. So this is nothing but a 3D visualization or you can see the E Chardham Darshan you can have with the help of satellite data sitting in Jaipur and sitting at your respective places. So this is the fresh snow and this when, you know, the, you were seeing the dirty ice there that uh, albedo was low. Now on the other side of this uh, Gangotri glacier is the Kedarnath, you know, area. So these are the two other glacier systems here, Ch Chorabari glacier and the Champion glacier. And this is the Kedar valley, you know. So this is the Kedarnath area. This is Kedarnath valley, which is a very narrow a gorge and very difficult area. Now, on the other side of this Kedar Valley is the Vadrinath area. You know, that uh, there is another glacial system called Satopanth Glacier. So, this is the Satopanth Glacier here. This is Chokhamba Peak. And this is the Satopanth Glacier. This, what you can see, is the fresh snow over the glacier. And as you go down on this glacier, then the river Alaknanda uh, will originate uh, from the Badrinath. So this is uh, a village called Mana village here. And here is the location of Badrinath. So this is how many of these rivers, you know, they are originating from the snout of this glacial system. Uh, so these areas are very remote and inaccessible. But using the help of technology, we can create this type of three-dimensional models and understand how the river systems or the how the, how the water resources, uh, you know, how the water we uh, you know originates. 
uh, especially in the Himalayan region, and trickle down so all the way and provides water uh, in Ganga and Yamuna for the uh, fertile plains of Indo-Gangetic uh, region. So, using satellite data, you can also monitor the sounds of these glaciers. Now, the Gangotri glacier has gone back almost 800 to 900 meters because of the warming, which you can see in this image. This is around 1990 image. This is the last year image. You can see the significant reduction in the ice at the snout. Or snout is nothing but the mouth of the glacier. And last year, we had a big landslide also in this region. So, you can see this most of this area is covered by the silt. Uh, in Gangotri, uh, in the Gomuk area. This is another beautiful animation. You can see how a glacier moves. You can see a moving glacier. Uh, we have com you know, combined almost 30 years of satellite data put together and shown you that how this glacier slowly moves. And this glacial ice, when reaches uh, to a lower altitude, melts over here and then start producing the liquid water for our river system. So using the sequential images, one can also calculate the velocity of the glacier by which velocity. So as you can see, at the higher altitude, glacier moves around 22 meters per year. But at the snout, it moves only 5 to 10 meters per year. So it's a very slow movement. Most of these glaciers, their velocity is reducing because they're, uh, you know, their mass is being reduced because of the melting. The temperature in the high altitude is rapidly increasing. And many of these glaciers are you know, now under threat because they are losing very fast the accumulated ice. And uh, it is estimated that in the next 20, 30 years, many of these glaciers will be very badly affected and have severe consequence to the uh, water availability in the Himalayan river systems. Similarly, one can also you know, see the glacial lakes. There are many lakes over these glacial bodies. Many of these lakes are also expanding because of the increasing temperature. So we have mapped the space glacial lakes in Uttarakhand Himalaya. And uh, uh, these lakes are also very you know, sometimes they become very vulnerable. Suddenly, there can be a glacial outburst and which can cause uh, flesh flooding. This, this, this particular glacial lake, you see that how rapidly this glacial lake is increasing simply because the glaciers, uh, you know, from the solid phase, uh, as the temperature is increasing, uh, they are becoming, uh, you know, liquid. So uh, the water uh, in the liquid form is increasing rapidly. Uh, since the temperature in these areas because of the global warming are increasing uh, substantially. So this type of phenomenon can be monitored using space data. Uh, and then whenever such type of lakes, you know, they, they can burst also. Because if the water volume in this lake becomes too large, they are uh, burns, etc., they become unsustainable and they cannot hold this water. And suddenly there will be a breach and then people living in the downstream areas you know, they will face uh, flash floods. Similar thing happens in Kedarnath area. Uh, many of you may be remembering that Kedarnath tragedy. And in fact, many of you must have seen that Kedarnath movie also. Uh, we can also monitor, you know, the water uh, height in reservoirs and in the, uh, in the rivers from this altimeter observations also. So water level observations also can be pro obtained from space data in reservoirs as well. Uh, so that we can monitor not only the water spread, but the water volume also can be estimated in the uh, river system. And similarly, in geo geoscience area, we can create maps for groundwater for 1 to 50,000 groundwater prospect maps. Uh, morphological maps can be created. Mineral prospect maps can be created. Information about landslides and earthquake and post-earthquake damages can also be estimated. Using radar technology, we can estimate the land subsidence also. So many examples are there because time is less. I will not go into details of this. This is one example which we have recently done a survey in uh, Chandigarh area. Large amount of groundwater is now being extracted. And this ex groundwater extraction is causing deformation of the surface. And this deformation, centimeter level deformation is happening two centimeter per year in Chandigarh area. And what it is causing, you know, the cracks in the buildings are coming because the ground is subsiding because huge amount of water from the ground is being extracted for the uh, use of the population. And that is causing sinking of the ground. And this sinking is producing this type of, you know, cracks in the building. So we need to monitor. And there are some areas where this uh, deformation is much large and some areas where deformation is less. It basically depends where from which areas you are extracting the groundwater. 
then agriculture I, we were talking about agriculture india has a net zone area of 141 million hectare we have a good amount of food grain so for providing food security we have now you know operational uh, production and forecast for uh, now this number is increased to 11 crops uh, of rabi uh, and kharif and operationally this information is being provided i will not talk much detail on it we are now also able to do farm level monitoring with the help of high satellite resolution data and digitization of cadastral maps you know these are the village uh, one village uh, you know boundaries and these are the individual fields of the farmers you have the survey and revenue numbers and you can monitor uh, throughout the year what type of crops are being produced what type of you know what is the crop condition and if at all crop damage etc is happening in this part uh, in individual fields that capability is uh, there today from space based data what you see is red color those who are remote sensing students they know that these are basically the agriculture fields and uh, these are the areas where they are fallow there is nothing much is happening throughout the year then again another examples are from our geostationary satellite for the weather application so using this geostationary satellites we can monitor the rainfall we have now capability of converting this data into rainfall fall maps so during the last year this funny cyclone which has hit the coast of india we could estimate that this red color region is having basically rainfall more than 15 mm per hour and then once this you know rain uh, this uh, cyclone is hitting the coast you know uh, you will see that suddenly the rainfall will uh, reduce so like this you know every 15 minute we can monitor this heavy rainfall event uh, uh, systems using satellite data now suddenly you see once it has hit the landmass the you know the system has become weak and rain has also reduced and slowly this system will dissipate and go towards the uh, assam and arunachal pradesh so this one particular cyclone you know this provided huge amount of rain to this large amount of area so this type of you know mapping and monitoring is possible using operational system so once the uh, you know uh, using high resolution data you can also uh, map the inundation regions you know because this suddenly so much of rainfall happens large amount of area they get affected by flood so all these blue regions what you see are the flood affected area by this fani cyclone with the help of microwave satellites immediately after the passage of cyclone we can map flood affected area and provide this information to the local administration for rescue and relief another important uh, products we have developed from this space uh, you know geostationary data is this pollution air pollution now air pollution you know next month onwards you will see large amount of areas of delhi etc because of biomass burning huge amount of you know crop residue is burnt in punjab and haryana and this type of smoke is produced this smoke you know we can monitor with the help of satellite data you can see this is dust and smoke all together in the month of october uh, 2017 and the delhi you know it suffers because of this air pollution extensively this is the ground picture of delhi so you can see that huge amount of dust and smoke is getting transported from from across the border afghanistan pakistan area and then from punjab residue burning also happens so put together situation become very bad in delhi and this is the ground picture you know the so much amount of haze was there in on october 29 2017 similarly you know we can also monitor the the smoke produced by the forest fire so these are the picture of forest fires in 2018 in uttarakhand himalaya region and all bright patches what you see is nothing but the smoke which is filled in this area and we can quantify this smoke in terms of you know aerosol optical depth uh, disasters you know disasters in another big uh, uh, application area so near real time uh, mapping and monitoring for natural disasters like floods cyclones landslides forest fire droughts and earthquakes these are the things which is there then uh, this type of information is provided to the stakeholders we are also now having a system where operationally the flood forecasting is done once you know this heavy rainfall events you can calculate that how much amount of water will be traveling into the river systems and the flood forecast for the downstream regions can be generated these were the some of the successful examples of flood forecast in himachal uh, and other region similarly this is the burnt area you know once the forest fire is there how much forests or the uh, on the ground has burnt that type of assessment also can be provided from satellite based observation these are the near real time observation on forest fires all these areas what you see are under forest fire right now uh, 
this is the smoke created by the forest fire and these are the live forest fires you can see from the space based observation and this information along with other information is provided to forest official for combating and uh, you know dousing these forest fire uh, almost in near real time there another picture of forest fire in haldwani area of uttarakhand uh, state uh, similarly these are the flood maps of kerala you know few years back in 2018 we have this massive floods we can also map the flood durations not only the flood extent but for how many days see let us say this red regions basically the flood water was there for last 18 days also once an area is there under flood for 18 days you can imagine that what type of problems it will be having so based on this input you can also plan you know different type of remedial actions on the ground uh, of course for a time more than 10 days if you have stagnant water there will be issues related to hy hygiene and the health of the residents so Uh, this information becomes very crucial for the governance you know people on the ground those who are involved in the governance uh, to uh, you know plan for uh, remedial measures similarly this year's uh, floods this is the flood map of bihar uh, in the month of july this year so you can see this is the normal water conditions and this is the uh, the flood affected regions of uh, bihar this is a high resolution flood uh, flooded area in bihar you can see this is a world view image of pre flood and then post flood you can see only the burns are seen and all these villages you know these houses this house this house all these houses are virtually now uh, you know in the uh, in the vicinity of very deep water so using this type of high resolution data also we are able to do flood mapping uh, so for various governance related applications like soil health card improved crop insurance better utilization of crop potential citizen friendly sustainable cities all these inputs are basically going uh, you know for uh, different ministries for generating developmental plans for community participation and for sustainable uh, growth uh, for uh, our towns and cities large amount of applications are uh, being done now all this data is now available on portals geo portals like bhuvan and then there are other portals like mosdac and and uh, some thematic portals are also there like india varis etc uh, so having told you about these applications you know you may be wondering some of you would like to learn more about this technology so uh, you know we have this indian institute of remote sensing iars in dehradun which is basically an institute of isro involved in capacity building Uh, for user community where people can use effectively remote sensing in geospatial data so we have short term and long term programs we have pg diploma 10 months program in nine specialization certificate courses then uh, short duration courses for decision makers special and tailor remote courses for different user departments and universities we also have live and interactive e learning program we have mtech and uh, uh, mtech program two years mtech program in specialization we have an msc program in geo information science with the university of twente itc netherlands and then large amount of ug pg and pg students are there in this uh, you know our campus so if any of you you want to have a specialized education after your you know your btech or masters you can think of you know uh, coming to iars for short uh, from one week to let us say two years program different type of programs are being offered now isro also has an ndvr to continuously provide satellite observation data so we are planning different type of satellites to augment our space infrastructure i will not go into details of it the slides can be made available to you so that uh, you are aware but one of the important satellite uh, which we are developing with nasa is called nasa isro synthetic aperture radar that is a radar system in l and s band which will be very useful for various applications like ice sheet mapping glacial mapping sea level mapping ecosystem and biomass changes in terms of you know quantifying carbon in terms of biomass estimation of forest in terms of mapping the wetlands agriculture productivity this sat uh, which is basically all weather data will be very very useful and many of you can think of utilizing if you go to this nasa isro uh, you know nisr website you can also download this type of nasa isro sar user you know handbooks which can give you an idea about the type of science related applications you can think of developing with the help of this upcoming uh, nisr dataset which will be freely available to all the users in the world so with these things i would like to uh, close my talk here because already i have more than the time
and i would like to thank each one of you for your participation and your patience hearing thank you very much uh, thank uh, thank you very much sir for your uh, informative and such a wonderful talk about the applications of remote sensing in gis so this is dr varun mishra from uh, suresh gyan vr university uh, sir we have received uh, several questions but uh, i would like to uh, take only few of them so sir, the first question is from satakshi Uh, she is asking: Is India is planning to launch a program to study ex extraterrestrial objects, and India is planning to send astronauts in future? Yeah. So uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrial objects like moon of Earth. You know, we have already sent last year a probe which is going around the moon and then pro providing very important data about the moon surface. Then we have a you know, follow-on program uh, for Mars. Uh, which is called mars orbiter mission 2 that is under uh, the, you know planning uh, so maybe by 23 or 24 uh, you will have a launch of mars orbiter mission we also are thinking to have a mission around venus and then you many of you must have also heard a program called gaganyaan program so this gaganyaan program of isro is to, the aim is to put uh, indian uh, you know astronauts the you know indian uh, you know lady or a man uh, by the year 2022 uh, so this is a very ambitious program which is already on and lot of work is being done where a regular astronauts will be able to go into space and successfully uh, able to land on uh, on earth okay i hope uh, i answered your question Uh, okay uh, so next question is uh, from uh, various students that uh, they want to know how uh, we can have the high resolution satellite data sets freely available because most of the work needs high resolution data sets but the data sets are not available freely by isro and other agencies so what yeah, is the uh, so basically what is happening how does the uh, earth observation market functions you see today around 1 meter data you know 1 meter special resolution data is uh, well from multiple sources uh, which is relatively you know, which is mostly free of cost of course isro we are still not providing any data free of cost because uh, there is a policy or you know, is uh, under review to provide free data access hopefully uh, very soon uh, new reforms you will get isro data free of cost also but these uh, other international players are providing now up to 1 meter and beyond let us say 5 meter 10 meter and then 30 meter uh, data free of cost is available from different but uh, the real uh, you know special activity is happening uh, from earth observation is for data which is uh, 50 cm and up to 20 cm this data since it is useful for many other applications which is uh, you know which uh, are commercial applications so that is why uh, these data sets are being you know they are basically available at a price at uh, at a cost uh, so for that you have to buy you know there is no way but uh, for uh, academic activity i will tell you that a lot of uh, private operators also are providing some limited data for academic activity free of cost so for example planet uh, labs uh, this is a private operator which is providing 3 meter special resolution data uh, every day uh, in multiple uh, wavelengths uh, so this this data if you go to planet explorer for academic purpose some limited data they are providing free of cost and isro also uh, for academic purposes some limited data they can provide free of cost to university students uh, if you write to them uh, to nrc that uh, provision is also there okay. okay thank you very much sir uh, the next question is from abhishek uh, he he wants to know uh, what is the future plan of isro to launch high resolution hyperspectral sensor because in india till yeah. now we don't have any hyperspectral sensors at high resolution yeah we have uh, currently one hyperspectral sensor uh, you know satellites called hisis uh, 30 meter currently it is uh, not available in civilian domain it is in strategic domain but hopefully uh, you know negotiations are on that at 30 meter special resolution this high c data may become in you know uh, available to public very soon uh, there is another uh, uh, you know satellite data which is available uh, at 30 meter special resolution it's not indian satellite data uh, there is an italian satellite data is called prisma so this is available to uh, to users now over indian landmass also isro is also involved uh, uh, you know in analysis of this data so this prisma data also one can download over indian landmass at 30 meter special resolution uh, we have certain plans uh, but right now there is no 
approved satellite for hyperspectral data at high spatial resolution. Uh, sir, uh, one question is from Ravi. He just want to ask uh, which satellite data is very useful for detecting groundwater. Uh, yeah, you can see that uh, groundwater uh, directly cannot be sensed with satellite observation because most of the satellite observations are providing information about the surface of the earth and let us say microwave data has some limited uh, you know penetration capability but that is of the order of few meters but groundwater is basically uh, available at the depths of let us say tens of meters to hundreds of meter in aquifer system so what satellite data provides you clues about uh, the areas where groundwater accumulation can be more like uh, you know some kind of uh, uh, fracture zones uh, some kind of geobotanical indicators. So 30 meter spatial resolution data will be good enough to provide these proxies or indicators of groundwater accumulation. Okay. Yes, sir. sir, one more question is uh, related to the data availability. The scat set one data, is it freely available or we have yeah. to purchase yeah. it? That set uh, data is totally freely available from NRSC websites. Uh, you can go to NRSC, uh, you know, NDC's data set. Uh, entire data, global data of SCATSAT from India is freely available. Uh, the backscatter data as well as the wind vector data, it's absolutely free. Okay. So the last question is from my side as well. Uh, just uh, I, I want to know sir, is this going to be planning I, for I, developing I, sir, early earthquake prediction system? Yeah, uh, can you repeat uh, because somebody was speaking in between. Yeah, sir. My question is: uh, Is ISRO is planning for developing early earthquake prediction system in near future using geospatial technology? Yeah, yeah. So earthquake prediction is a very difficult task. You know, in fact, I guess, uh, if you talk to an expert, you say it is not possible. But what we are planning now, this our NISR mission, you know, NASA ISRO sets, uh, synthetic aperture radar mission, uh, will be used for mapping the deformation uh, of the Earth crust, which can be, you know, linked to the uh, post seismic, uh, you know, post seismic or a seismic activities. So using this, uh, there is a plan now. Uh, once the satellite is up, we will be continuously observing the Himalayan system and other Indian crustal system for deformations. And these deformations, through the help of seismic data and modeling, can be used for providing early warning of a of a of a seismic activities. Thank you very much, sir, for enlightening us for your. Uh, very informative. Somebody, was, somebody wanted to ask something in between. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, thank you very much, sir. Sir, uh, now I would like to uh, request uh, Dr. Suraj Kumar, sir, for delivering a vote of thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, myself, Dr. Suraj Kumar Singh, Center, Ed, Center for Sustainable Development, uh, Suresh Gyan Vihar University, Jaipur, Rajasthan. On the behalf of the organizing team, I would like to thank Dr. Prakash Chauhan, sir. Director IIRS Dehradun India for giving his valuable time for the webinar. Now I'll conclude with some of the key highlights what the sir has highlighted in the webinar where he has focused on the space application program, how space missions, especially ISRO is working into the areas of space transportation, space infrastructure, capacity building and space applications. Especially he highlighted the applications of uh, earth observation satellites for land dynamic study soil degradation water set analysis <coughs> biodiversity conservation with the basics of remote sensing gis gps where he highlighted the focus of spatial data and non spatial data how those data sets can be used for land surface temperature analysis and sea surface temperature analysis apart from that he also highlighted the applications of microwave satellites where they are used for various kinds of flood dynamics analysis, forest fire incidents, and other applications of satellites in natural resource management. He also highlighted the applications of remote sensing and GIS uh, satellites for glaciers mapping, identifying and differentiating various kinds of snow glacier parameters, then having various kinds of crop damage assessment, watershed management, uh, groundwater prospect and research development. Apart from that, he also highlighted the applications in the field of infrastructure development, mm -hmm. canal system development, and how the ISRO mission is making India capable of doing Atma Nirbhar Bharat that our Honorable Prime Minister wants from each and every citizen. Finally, he concluded with the applications of remote sensing satellite and various 
uh, isro based agencies are creating various database portals where the data sets the users can download and can use for their mapping and management and finally he concluded how the various digital elevation model can be used for various kinds of topographical analysis where we can go for various kinds of reconnaissance surveys and various kinds of terrain modeling and with this i would <coughs> like to thank to all the participants for being patient and listening to our speakers i would like to thank suresh gyan vihar university for giving us this opportunity to conduct this uh, interview and especially dr prakash chauhan sir that from his bd schedule he has taken out a minute and he has graced us and with this i'll uh, uh, ask all the participants to please turn off their cameras so that we can have a group photograph so it's requested with all the participants that please turn off their camera so that we can have a group photograph and thereafter we'll conclude the session thanks a lot have a good day thank you thank you it's a request please all the participants turn on their cameras for a group photograph please only one minute will be given for this please turn on your cameras rishab please take the photograph yes sir if done please uh, comment okay sir sir done sir okay sir thanks a lot sir for giving your valuable time to us have a good day sir okay. thanks sir thanks sir thank you thank you, okay, thank have you a good day. so much sir thank you thanks to all the participants thank you sir, thank you, sir very much thank, thank you. you thank you it was very very nice thank thank you everyone thank you thank you sir thank you so much thank you sir thank you sir we can close the session sir you will receive the feedback form in your email please feel fill the feedback form in your email i shared within 10 minutes for your certification sure sir okay sir okay sir thank you please fill it sir sir thank you so much sure sir sure thank you sir thank you very much namaste thank you thank you thank you So thank you. Thank you very much.